Hello, how are you doing? My name is Dr. Nathan Hare, and I'm an allergist starting with UPMC Susquehanna Health. And today we're going to be doing a Facebook Live talking about oral immunotherapy for food allergies. So thank you for coming. We're welcome. Before we get started, just touch briefly on the fact that while we're discussing medical topics, this is not actual medical advice that we're giving here today. So if you have any questions, feel free to talk to your regular doctor or give my office a call. So to get started, um, if you have questions as we go, this is Facebook Live, so please send them in and we'll try to address them as we go through. We're gonna be talking about oral immunotherapy for food. So what is that? Um, it's a way to desensitize you if you are allergic to a food. Uh, so hopefully you can eat more of the food than you would get with an accidental exposure. So hopefully then you're already eating it, your immune system is used to it. And then if you eat it by accident, you don't have a life-threatening allergic reaction. So, how long has this been uh, something that we've been able to do? Uh, they started studying it more over the last 10 to 15 years. And um, really over the last five years, the data is getting better and better that this really does uh, quite a good job for a large number of patients. Uh, what foods can you do this for? Well, if you think about it, the main foods that people have allergies to are milk, egg, and peanut, particularly under age five, uh, wheat, soy, tree nuts, seafood. Uh, for now, the best data that we have is actually for milk, egg, and peanut. Um, and there's sometimes patients don't do quite as well with milk allergy and doing oral immunotherapy. Um, seafood, that's kind of tricky to do. It can be done, but not so much. Nuts can be done, peanuts can be done, as we talked about. Soy and wheat, it's just not as common to be allergic to them, but they could potentially be done. I like to go over anytime we're discussing this, what exactly is an allergy? I think it's helpful to set the, um, the basis for what we're talking about. So an allergy means that your immune system has decided it's gonna have a problem with something that normally shouldn't. So it's an overreaction to something harmless. Your immune system thinks you're about to get a threat and it's trying to protect you, but there's no actual threat, but you end up with symptoms because your immune system's all revved up. And so what happens with food then is you get often a life-threatening allergic reaction. Um, and so the goal is, well, how do you treat that? I mean, normally what we've done for years is try to minimize exposure because obviously if it causes problems when you eat it, you don't wanna eat it, and that makes sense. What they've done is they figured out that on average, maybe 10% of people a year, maybe more, who have a food allergy and all they do to manage is try to avoid eating that food, uh, maybe 10% a year will end up in the emergency room with some type of life-threatening allergic reaction. So the idea is, can we do more? I mean, can you do more than just avoid eating it? Um, and so what they've done in other areas of allergies, so for instance, if you have environmental allergies like for pollen or animal danders or dust mites, or if you have stinging insect allergy, they can do allergy shots. And those are ways to, you know, what is called immunotherapy, to try to retrain your immune system so that now it's paying less attention to what's causing problems for you, or maybe not even causing problems at all, or maybe curing you. And so what they try to do um, is something similar for food allergies. Can we retrain your immune system so that you don't have problems like you used to? And so when they looked at that, they did look at, at one point whether or not you could do allergy shots for the food, but that doesn't really work. It tends to be um, too dangerous. Um, and so then the other options that are coming along are ways to try to retrain the immune system that involve either eating the food or a patch. And I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that today as far as the patch part, but um, there's supposed to be a patch at least for peanut allergy coming out later this year. And it works kind of like a nicotine patch in the sense that you put the patch on every so often and it has peanut molecules in it and they go through your skin to your immune system and over time try to retrain your immune system that way so that you can eat more peanut than you would have uh, with an accidental exposure. You can do what's called sublingual immunotherapy where you put some of the food under your tongue, hold it there for a little bit and then swallow. And that's different than oral immunotherapy where you just swallow it. Sublingual immunotherapy tends to have fewer side effects, but it also doesn't work as well. Uh, and so the oral immunotherapy, while there's a little bit higher risk of a life-threatening reaction, um, a lot of patients tend to do better with it. In general, about 80% of people who do oral immunotherapy for food, they will actually be able to get to what's called a maintenance dose successfully. And a maintenance dose at this point in time is eating more every day than you would eat uh, with an accidental exposure. So the protocols that I've been using 
recently, you're basically trying to eat eight peanuts a day would be your goal. Um, although not everybody can tolerate it, but at least three peanuts a day. And so again, 80% of people can get there, 20% can't. And you might say, well, okay, what about the people who can't? What's going on with them? Well, it looks like roughly a third of the people who can't make it to maintenance, it's because they can't take the taste of the peanut or other food, the taste is too much. Maybe a third, um, the schedule of having to eat it every day becomes a bit much to deal with, and so they can't keep it up. And then the other third probably have um, some kind of allergic reaction or too many allergic reactions and have to drop out because it's just too much. So the, um, the idea then is maybe, again, 20% can't make it, 80% tend to. And then you want to look at, okay, so what's actually happening um, in terms of your risk, right? We talked about a 10% chance for anaphylaxis if you do nothing other than try to avoid eating the food. So what you end up doing is if you're trying to desensitize, you start with a really low dose and then work your way up till you're eating a higher dose. And that process can take six to 12 months depending on the protocol. And then when they've looked at it, at least for peanut, there was a paper that came out in the last year, it looks like you have at least a 10% chance for anaphylaxis even with the oral immunotherapy for the first six months or so on maintenance. And then after that, your risk may drop to 6%. Um, and they don't know what the long-term risk is. But the idea though is that even though you have still some, you're trading a 10% chance of anaphylaxis for at least initially a 10% chance of anaphylaxis with the oral immunotherapy, it may be lower longer term, but even then when I talk to families, a lot of them say, yeah, despite that, they would still rather have that there's have the uh, reassurance of the fact that their child can still eat the food on a daily basis and not have to deal with uh, reading food labels for that particular food, uh, which can become quite cumbersome. So in general, uh, the foods that are more commonly done for oral immunotherapy are going to be the egg and the peanut and tree nuts and some with milk. But like I mentioned, some of the patients with milk don't do as well. Um, the issue with egg and milk is that trying to decide with the families, is it worth the time and effort? Because those are allergies that are usually outgrown, the milk and the egg allergy. So I always tell people, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not great that you have a food allergy, but if you are allergic to milk or egg, that's still a good one to have because I would rather have you have an allergy that's more likely going to be outgrown than ones that it's not. Peanut and tree nuts tend not to be outgrown. Seafood allergy tends not to be outgrown. So that's something to where it may be more relevant to be able to look at doing a desensitization. So what does a desensitization for this look like? I don't know if any of you have ever had allergy shots before, but the idea, like I said, with an allergy shot, you start with a uh, microscopic dose and you build up over time and you eventually get to a top dose, which is called a maintenance dose. And then that dose you get on a, in a recurring interval, at least for the allergy shots, you get them like every one to two, one to two times a month. Um, and then you have to continue with the allergy shots for at least three years before they found, because they found that you have to be on them that long for your immune system to change, but then get the changes locked into place so that hopefully you can go off and not have to stay on them forever. So the idea with the food oral immunotherapy is similar, that they're trying to desensitize along the same idea, same lines. And so what you do is you come, you would come into the clinic, and this is assuming you've had a visit where you, initially you would have to have a talk and a visit to figure out, are you actually allergic or not? Look at any kind of allergy tests you've had done for the food, you know, blood tests, skin tests, and then some other baseline labs that would have to be done. And then assuming that you are still interested, we would talk briefly about the oral immunotherapy. And then you have to set up a separate visit just to have like, it's usually a one hour face-to-face -face time with me to where you're discussing all the risks and benefits of this oral immunotherapy, which can take at least an hour to discuss most of the time. And then assuming you wanted to start, we would schedule what's called a day one. And during that time, you would actually come into clinic and you or your child, whoever's going through this, and you start with a microscopic dose. And the goal would be to get you through 10 doses on that first day. And the doses are given every 15 minutes. We check vital signs in between. We check on the patient and make sure they're doing okay before we give the next dose. And then if you, assuming nothing happens, which most of the time nothing does, you get through that first day, those first 10 doses, then we keep you in clinic for an hour afterwards just to make sure that nothing's gonna happen. And then we send you home. And then you or your child, whoever's doing the desensitization has to go home and you have to eat that food at the dose that we finished up with. You have to take that dose every single day for one to two weeks. And then 
two, one to two weeks, you come back into the clinic, we give you your next dose up, we bump your dose, we watch you for 45 minutes and then we send you home. And then most of the protocols, after you, assuming everything's successful after that first day one, the rapid desensitization, most of them have roughly 20 visits after that every one to two weeks. So the, depending on how often you're coming in, can it take, again, like I said earlier, anywhere from six to 12 months for you to complete the program. Now, there can be you know different things that happen. So people always wanna know, can you miss a dose? In other words, if you all go all the way back to the beginning if you happen to miss. And the short answer is no. Uh, realistically, we ask you, you're supposed to be dosing every single day at home, and then you're coming in every one to two weeks. So if you're coming in once a week to get your dose bumped up, you actually have one free miss built in to where you can miss a day and nothing, there's no consequence. You don't have to go back on your dose or anything else. And if you're coming in every two weeks, you have two free misses. So we try to keep it flexible so this is doable for you or your child. Uh, without causing a lot of problems and actually fit into your regular life as much as possible. Things to think about, um, you do have to have a two hour exercise restriction after each dose um, because exercise is one of the things that contributes to increased risk for a life-threatening allergic reaction with this because you are eating something you're allergic to. Uh, and then people want to know, well, how often does that happen that you'd have trouble? I mean, one study at least that looked at peanut, it looked like they had to use uh, uh, symptoms that needed epinephrine during buildup, maybe one, like seven times out of 10,000 doses that were given in that particular study. So it's not a huge amount of time. Um, more common uh, is to have GI side effects. So 10 to 15% of people may have GI side effects, which primarily are be heartburn or vomiting. And then maybe at least one study is like 2.7% of the time you can get a more severe allergic inflammation of your esophagus called eosinophilic esophagitis. And that can happen, but um, we'd keep an eye on things and see how things go. But you can, uh, we're constantly evaluating you or your child through the, throughout this whole desensitization process to see uh, how that goes. And then the next question is, okay, so let's say you, it works and right, and you, it takes a while, but you, you get there and you're now eating eight peanuts a day, uh, if, if peanut is the food that we're talking about, then if possible, or if it fits your, your goals with this, is we'd have you come in and do what's called a max challenge where we actually triple in the amount of peanut that you're eating and make sure that you can eat as much as you want. And so we'd actually have you eat 24 peanuts if that's the food we're challenging. And then after that, then you go home and you're at what's called maintenance. And we get labs at the beginning before this whole thing started and we get labs once you're at maintenance and then check you once a year after that. And then the next question becomes, well, how long do you have to do this? And this is new, relatively speaking. So they are still trying to work out, the scientists who are studying this are still trying to work out, how long do you actually have to stay at maintenance? And so for now, it looks like you're gonna to need to be at maintenance eating that food every single day for at least three years. And then they're starting to study, is that actually the case that you have to stay on it every day the rest of your life or not? The answer is for now, most people, if you stop eating it, it, looks like you will go back to being allergic. But interestingly, they're finding out, now they've started doing some studies, the younger you are when you start this, the more likely you are to be successful. And they did a study a couple years ago with peanut allergic kiddos, and they started them as young as nine months. Some of those were actually able to stop once they hit maintenance for, and stayed on maintenance for a while. They were able to stop them for a month, go off, and rechallenge them. And a huge proportion, almost 80% of them passed their challenge after a month off. So it's not set in stone that it's gonna be every day the rest of your life, but for now, for this purpose, uh, if we're gonna do the desensitization, we initially will say this, this has a chance that this may be uh, the rest of your life. Often it's done uh, with kiddos who are in preschool, kindergarten, elementary school, and middle school, and tends to be the, the older you are, like once, once you're probably beyond age 15 or so, not as many of the patients are interested in doing this. And I think some of it's more important because like I said, they're starting to find out the younger you are when you start, the more likely you are to be successful. So that's important to keep in mind. But also the younger you are when you start, it's more concerning for parents because kids at that age are more likely to put their fingers into other kids' foods and actually again, accidentally get exposed to food that they're allergic to in the school setting or elsewhere. And hopefully by the time that you're 15 or older, that's less of an issue. In most cases it is. So you may not be doing as much, much of this in patients over age 15, but it still could be something we could talk about. So at this point in time, 
uh, like I said, most of the foods that I've done, is, well, the main foods I've done is peanut. I've done a little bit with tree nuts, and I'm hoping to add other foods down the road. Um, but some of it we basically take it on a case by case basis. So it's a lot to, to think about because it's a heavy time commitment from families, and it's a lot to think about having to do this on a daily basis, every day, for a few years. Uh, but the families I've helped with so far have been pretty happy with how it's worked out. And um, most of my patients have done really well with this. And the ones who have had issues with it, most of the time, like I said, it's, it's usually just GI symptoms, heartburn or vomiting. And only rarely, I think I've only had a couple cases where somebody actually had a life-threatening allergic reaction. So the main thing with this is being prepared going in and knowing what you'd be you know, getting yourself into. Well, we don't have any questions from our viewers, um, but if um, someone were to have a question, um, how would they be able to reach you? So I would say contact my office um, at this point in time. Basically, it's 451 River Avenue, 570-320-7070, um, and that's UPMC Susquehanna Health Allergy Clinic. Um, and if you have questions, we're happy to help. And if you need me more specifically, um, you're welcome to book a visit with me. Thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Um, we really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. Have a Thank good day. You.